Paul and I were at uh, the Canadian Wind Energy Association conference last year, and Paul was given the award uh, for the, the man of the year, or the person of the year, uh, from the Canadian Wind Energy Association for the work that he'd done in Ontario. And I remember we were, we were standing uh, in the concourse, and a senior bureaucrat from Environment Canada came up and shook Paul's hand and said, you know, I really got to hand it to you because uh, four years ago, or five years ago, when you first came to Ontario, I told you you were crazy. I said, the ideas you are pushing will never happen in Ontario. You're insane. There's no point in even talking about that. Uh, and six years later, what Paul's going to be talking about tonight is the most uh, progressive renewable energy policy we have in North America today, and it happened in Ontario. So I want, I, I want to say that because if, if you think what Paul's talking about is, is insane and can't happen here in Alberta, that was the same reaction he got in Ontario, uh, and it happened there. So that's what I want to set the stage with, and it's my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Paul Bell. Oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Tim, uh, Rob, and thank you uh, for the invitation here. Merci beaucoup. Uh, C'est un great uh, honor uh, to, to participate in uh, the session this evening. And um, I'm happy to be in Alberta. Uh, when I told my colleagues in Colorado I was coming to Alberta, they all chuckled. You said, you really? You're going to Alberta to talk about renewable energy? Or are you nuts? <laughs> and I said, yes, I am nuts. I've been called nuts many times. And you'll probably think the same thing as I go through this presentation tonight. Anyway, I'm going to talk about how we can bring an energy revolution, not just to Alberta, but to Canada, and as well to the United States. Because those of you who read my books and read my writing know that I argue that renewable energy is no longer an alternative source of energy. It's a commercial generating technology. Whether we're talking about the giant wind farms in, around Pincher Creek or all across the breadth of North America or here in the Netherlands or in a fortified hilltop village such as Montefalcone in the southern uh, Italy in the Campania region, wind energy has come of age as a commercial generating technology and has major effects on the communities where it's located. The introduction of wind energy in this fortified hilltop village was the biggest thing to happen to the people of this community since it was conquered by the Romans before the birth of Christ. So wind energy has made a difference in communities all across the world, literally at the ends of the earth in Finisterre, in the far northwest corner of Galicia, Finisterre, wind energy has come of age as commercial generating technology. It's doing things for people in communities around the world. But it's not just wind energy. That's my specialty, of course. But it's also biomass and biogas. And, of course, in solar photovoltaics, this is the Solarstadt. This is the solar city of Freiburg, Germany, solar city. And you know how we Americans, particularly we Americans, your Canadians are much more modest people, but you know how we Americans, our architects, have been thumping their chests about their zero energy houses that they're building down there. If you did that in German, Germany, the Germans would be polite. They might chuckle under their breath because these are not zero energy houses. They are plus energy houses, and we need to be building plus energy houses today, not zero energy houses. So wind energy is growing at an exponential rate, mostly in Northern Europe. We are seeing some growth here in, in North America, finally, and in Asia, but it is growing at an exponential rate. 40,000 megawatts here in North America, most of that's in the United States. Of course, 80,000 megawatts in uh, Europe, 25,000 megawatts is in Germany alone, and 20,000 megawatts is in Spain. 50,000 megawatts in Asia, most of that's in China. You'll be hearing a lot more from the Chinese in years to come. Solar photovoltaics, we have 20,000 megawatts install, installed worldwide. Uh, major markets are Germany, of course, that's last year in 2009, they installed 3,800 megawatts. Again, for you as Albertans, I have to emphasize, that's megawatts with an M and not kilowatts with a K. Yes, that's a lot of generating capacity. Italy is the world's second largest market with 700 megawatts last year. Japan is continuing to fall further and further behind in market share. And USA, of course, brings up the rear. California is the largest market here in North America for the time being at 200 megawatts per year. You'll see more of this in a moment. So solar photovoltaics also are growing at an exponential rate. But once again, the growth is mostly taking place in northern Europe. Currently, it's about 50% of all the solar photovoltaic capacity in the world is in Germany. Interesting. Not a lot of sun in Germany, is there? But that's where they're doing it. And in Spain and uh, now in Italy as well. So I'm going to set the stage for the problem that we face here in North America, the political situation that we face in North America, and why we need to do this. Because North Americans have simply been dabbling around the edges of renewable energy policy now for 30 years. It's time we actually do something. Because the problems we face are so significant, and there's so little recognition of the problems we face, 
that we haven't taken action, either in Canada or in the United States, it's time to do something. Because there are a number of profound issues, not just climate change. Forget climate change for a moment. North America is totally dependent on liquid fuels or transportation. We have very little public transportation uh, in the United States. Good to see sort of buses here in, uh, in a, a transit system in, in Edmonton. That's much better than my, the community we come from. Uh, but our domestic supplies of liquid fuels, despite your efforts, uh, Alberta's efforts, are continuing to decline in North America. And that's a serious issue for us. And there are a number of things that happen when we're dependent on liquid fuels, only some of which make the news. Some countries might actually do very, very stupid things, like send their tanks in other countries to borrow their oil for a while. <laughs> so let's just take an example of the scale of the problem that we face and how much we actually need to do. So let's say Al Gore said that within 10 years we could have 100% clean energy in the United States. So let's just see if Al Gore, being a politician, kind of stretching it just a little bit. I'm sure your politicians here in Alberta don't stretch the truth at all. Uh, no, no. So let's say we want to offload all the fossil fire generation in the United States. We consume uh, 4,000 bi uh, billion kilowatt hours a year, 4,000 terawatt hours per year. So three quarters of that's fossil fire. We're going to take that away and we'll use windmills because I, I know the numbers for windmills. But I'm not done yet because I know we'll leave out you Canadians. You need to do this too. Let's take out this chunk here, 155 terawatt hours per year of fossil fire generation in, in Canada. Let's say we're going to get rid of that too. How many windmills does it take? Well, it take, takes a lot. It takes a lot. It takes 1,600,000 megawatts of wind turbines. So a wind turbine a day is about two megawatts apiece. So, well, that's a lot of windmills. Yes. Uh, but I'm not done yet. Let's make it a little bit tougher because, as I said, we're dependent on liquid fuels for transportation. We have to convert our passenger vehicle fleet as a minimum to electric vehicles now. I mean, T. Boone Pickens talking about getting wind turbines in and moving everybody to natural gas. But if we're going to go to that much trouble, why go to natural gas and become dependent on natural gas for transportation? We should just make the move to electric vehicles. And I think T. Boone Pickens is a piker. He doesn't have enough ambition. He only wants to earn another billion. And he can earn a lot more if he has the vision to say we need to move to electric vehicles. So, Okay, United States and Canada, it's going to add another 800,000 megawatts of wind in North America. That's a lot, 2,500,000 megawatts of wind. It's 120 times where we are today. Can we do it? Do we even have enough steel in North America, Canada, the United States? Do we have the manufacturing capacity? Do we have the will? That's another question. Well, let's just take an example. Let's take the heavy truck industry. Canada builds about 50,000 uh, megawatts equivalent of heavy trucks a year. United States, 150,000 megawatts of heavy trucks a year. Heavy trucks, very similar to windmill, lots of steel, lots of electrical stuff, lots of components. And let's see if we could offset, take the entire heavy truck industry, say we're in a wartime footing like Roosevelt back during World War II, or you here in Canada, you said, okay, we're not going to build any more cars. As of today, we're going to build trucks and tanks. Well, let's just say, for example, I'm not saying we should do this, but just a hypothetical. Let's say we convert the heavy truck industry, which can produce 200,000 megawatts equivalent per year, to wind turbines. How long would it take? Well, Al Gore's wrong. It's not 10 years. It's going to take us 13, or at least less than two decades. We can do it. We can do it now, and we can do it with less than two decades. We should get started.